Thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and begin. Uh, we welcome you to the Senate Committee on Education and uh, uh, we open our, our, our education committee today and we welcome those that are online and present by phone. Um, thank you for your patience. I know we had it at uh, 1130 or call the chair. We were waiting for that last committee to get over and so we uh, um, we are now moving forward. So um, will the secretary please call the roll. Vice Chair Dondero Loop. Here. Senator Hardy. Here. Senator Hammond. Here. Senator Lang. Here. Senator Buck. Here. Senator Donate. Here. Senator Dennis. Oops. Here. Thank you very much. Um, so everyone's here, uh, we do have a quorum. So, um, and then just uh, real quick, if you're if this is the first time you're getting on, um, committee information is available on Nellis, which can be accessed. Why is yeah. it bouncing over there, should it be? Excuse yeah, me, got, this is Broadcast and Production Services. Can the secretary please mute your microphone? Oh, Thank you. I was going to try to um, figure out who that was. I couldn't tell who it was. Um, great. Um, so uh, for those, uh, uh, so the committee is available on Nellis through the legislature's website. And there's also a help. Um, you can help uh, click on the help and it'll walk you through what you need to do um, to get on and register if you want to participate. Um, and when you testify, state and spell your name for the record. And then we'll take public comment at the very end with uh, public comment limited two minutes per person. And uh, you can also submit your in writing your full comments. And um, uh, as outlined in the agenda, you can email or fax them to the committee manager. And with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and begin. We're going to start today uh, first. Um, and actually, let me go over the agenda real quick. I did earlier, but just so that you know, um, we're going to do work session first. Um, we are not going to do SB 151 today. I know that they're still working out a couple things on that. Um, so we're, we're going to start with SB 160 and then 193 on work session. And then we will um, go to um, Senate Bill 353, um, 363, and we will finish with 347. So um, so we will uh, have uh, Ms. Sturm walk us through the work session document. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jen Sturm, Committee Policy Analyst. Uh, so we have two bills on today's work session. The work session documents can be found on Nellis. Uh, the first bill on work session today is Senate Bill 160, uh, which was presented by Senator Keefer on March 8th. Uh, the bill clarifies existing law that requires each school district and charter school to enter into a cooperative agreement with the Nevada Higher Education Institution to offer dual credit courses. The bill authorizes a school district or charter school to enter into such agreements with one or more higher education institutions in another state. If such an agreement is created, a copy of the agreement must be submitted to Nevada's Department of Education. And there are three amendments um, for your consideration. Uh, Senator Kikafer and the Nevada System of Higher Education uh, submitted an amendment, which is attached to the work session document on Nellis, uh, which clarifies that a school district or charter school may only enter into a cooperative agreement with an out-of-state institution if a regionally accredited institution in Nevada does not offer such a course. Uh, the second proposed amendment uh, would, uh, would be to include university schools for profoundly gifted students to the list of entities that can enter into dual credit agreements with institutions in other states. And the third proposed amendment by the bill sponsor would clarify that any institution offering dual credit, whether in-state or out-of-state, must be regionally accredited. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, qu questions from the members? I am not seeing any. Um, no questions, I will entertain a motion. Men do pass. Second. 
We have an amendment to pass from uh, men do pass uh, motion from Senator Hardy and a second from Senator Hammond. Any further discussion on the motion? All right, all in favor say, oh wait, we got to do the thing, right? No roll. So if secretary can do the roll call vote. Vice Chair Dundara Loop. Yes. Senator Hardy. Yes. Senator Hammond. Yes. Senator Lang. Yes. Senator Buck. Yes, and Chair Dennis, may I make a statement quickly? Yes, go ahead. I just wanna remind this group, I'm all for this bill, but that remember a dual enrollment credit doesn't wait as much as, and so these students are not earning as much weight on their GPA as students sitting in a, um, an IB or AP class in a high school. So they're actually going to a college um, and taking a college credit um, at a university and it doesn't wait as much. I just wanted that on record somewhere. Thank you, and I'm a yes. Thank you. And I'll make a comment about that in just a second, but since we're in the middle of a motion and a vote, we'll continue. Senator Donate. Yes. Chair Dennis. Yes, thank you. And, and I will I will make a quick statement. Um, I, I heard that message um, before when we heard, I think this bill, I think, believe you brought it up and actually have an amendment uh, to amend one of my bills to actually put that in there from your bill. Um, you made that recommendation and I, and I have, have gotten that out when I know we're working on that. So you'll, you'll see that sometime next week. All right, so with that, let's go to the next um, uh, work session. Chair Dennis, did you yes. want to assign that to someone on the floor? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to assign that to uh, Senator Keefer. Um, and I know he tried to get on. Somehow we didn't get him the link. So if he's on, thank you, um, Senator. And we we amended and do passed it. So let's see. Did he ever get on? Okay. So maybe he's just listening to it. Um, but um, I will assign the the, uh, the the floor to him. Thanks. So let's let's go on to the next one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, Jen Sturm, Committee Policy Analyst. Uh, the second bill on today's work session is Senate Bill 193. Uh, this bill was sponsored by the Interim Legislative Committee on Senior Citizens, Veterans, and Adults with Special Needs. Um, the bill was presented by Senator Hardy on March 10th. Senate Bill 193 requires the Board of Regents of the University of Nevada to submit a report concerning student veterans to the legislature. The bill also requires the board to give preference in admission to certain veterans in each nursing program and program for the education of teachers. Regarding tuition charges, SB 193 removes the time limitation for matriculating within the Nevada system of higher education for certain veterans, prohibits the assessment of tuition charges against veterans and their spouses and dependents using post 9-11 educational assistance and prohibits the assessment of tuition charges against students using survivors and dependents educational assistance. Um, and again, with this bill, there is one amendment for your consideration, uh, which is attached to the work session document in Nellis. Uh, the Nevada System of Higher Education proposed an amendment to clarify in subsection 2 L2 of section five, that tuition is prohibited for the spouse and dependents who use the post 9-11 educational assistance benefits. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Chair, Joe Hardy for the record. Senator Hardy. There, um, I need to clarify something on the intent. Uh, the intent um, left out a, a little word that um, after tuition, there should be a little word that says charge. So it should read amend subsection two parentheses L or one of section five of the bill to clarify that tuition charge is prohibited for the spouse and dependents for using 9-11 educational assistance benefits as indicated in the digest. <clears throat> so it, it comports uh, so that word was left out. So the actual language 
of the amendment that's being produced is okay. Uh, the actual language is okay. And then I need, while I'm still talking about that language, I needed to make sure that everybody knows that just because you're special as a veteran or a spouse or a dependent or any program, you still have to have the qualifications for admission to any of those programs. So the, the uh, advantage that the veteran has or the spouse or the dependent is if they uh, are equal on equal footing to somebody else, then the veteran uh, trumps the non-veteran or the non-veteran spouse or dependent. But I just need to put that on the record so people realize that the intent isn't to prohibit uh, tuition, uh, but the tuition charge uh, is being prohibited. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. And I'll, I'll have um, Mr. Killian, can you just confirm that that's okay and we're, we're not missing something there? Thank you, Mr. Chair, Ashley Killian, Committee Council. Yes, so this section is regarding tuition charges, which are um, separate from what you might think about as tuition. Tuition charges under law are the fees charged to out-of-state students for tuition. In-state students pay registration fees instead. Um, and so this, this section of NRS that's being amended to add these provisions refers to tuition charges, which is what you might think of as out-of-state tuition. So um, uh, what, what Senator Hardy described is, is accurate. This bill would um, prohibit tuition charges, so out-of-state tuition against um, these veterans and spouses and dependents. Thank you very much. Senator Lang. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so I've talked to some of the universities and they told me this will be really hard for them to do because a lot of these programs are programs that are filled already and uh, it's very competitive to get into that. And the other thing I didn't realize that I just heard is that out-of-state out students could come here and get preference to get into to these classes or have an opportunity to get into those classes. And I would prefer, uh, if we're gonna do this, it would be in-state um in-state residents that would have preference could you clarify those please yeah S senator hardy can you do you, or, or do we need to call somebody else but either one can you talk about that yes i'd be glad to uh, i think one of the things that we recognize is that we want more people coming from outside of the state into the state to go through our programs because then we can keep them uh, so we are are way low in everything. To your other point about you know the programs are filled, we want them to be filled and we want the programs to grow. Uh, so I'm 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 recognizing that if the programs are filled, that's a wonderful thing, uh, and that will give us motivation to get a bigger program. And so I'm not trying to displace people that are in the programs. I'm not trying to displace people that are in state or I, I want everybody to come. I want everybody to have the opportunity to stay here. So this is in essence, a hopefully a recruiting opportunity as well as a keep ourselves in Nevada opportunity. But just because you are good doesn't mean you're better than somebody else who has a, a better grade point or a better interview or whatever. So we we do not want this um, to have somebody who's not qualified to be accepted into the program. If they're qualified and they're on equal footing of somebody else that's qualified, then we want them uh, to have that opportunity uh, to come to the program. In other words, we want to give the veteran an opportunity uh, to come stay and be trained and stay here in Nevada. I don't know if that uh, lays your concern, but that's my intent. Thank just you. So, just oh. so I can hold on a second, just so I can clarify, um, this would this is only dealing with um, nursing and teaching programs, is that correct? Correct. And, and we know that we have, we have a huge need. That's one of our the top two things that we've identified that we, we need to get more. That's why we started Nevada State College. Um, Senator Lang. Yeah, so I, I appreciate the intent. I just, I'm going to vote no on this, not because I disagree with what is happening, 
I disagree with some of the mechanics in the bill. And so I reserve my right to change my vote. Okay. Any other, any other discussion? All right. I will entertain a motion. Do pass. So, okay. It's, it's a, uh, amend and do pass, I believe. Amend and do pass. Senator Buck, second from Senator Donate. Yep. Um, any further discussion? Okay, uh, Secretary can take the roll call vote. Vice Chair Dundero Loop. Yes, uh, I would like to have a little further discussion, but um, I will vote yes. Senator Hardy. Yes. Senator Hammond. Yes. Senator Lang. Vote no and reserve my right. Senator Buck? Yes. Senator Donate? Yes. Sen uh, Chair Dennis? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, so, Senator Hardy, if you would do the floor statement on that. Sure, thanks. All right, so we, we will now move on to uh, bill presentations. Um, and I am going to open the hearing on Senate Bill 353, uh, which requires the Department of Education to review certain assessments. Um, this is the bill that came from the Interim Education Committee. Um, and I asked uh, Senator uh, Marilyn Dondero Loop, who was a member of the, the Interim Committee, um, if she would do the presentation. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, and for the record, I am Marilyn Dondero Loop, uh, representing Senate District 8 in Clark County. I am pleased to be here today to present Senate Bill 353, which requires the Nevada Department of Ed to review assessments, prescribe regulations to limit the time spent on assessments, and require districts to request a waiver to exceed those limits. Many of you remember Senate Bill 303 sponsored by Senator Joyce Woodhouse in 2017. The bill required the Nevada Department of Education to audit the assessment tools and examinations used to monitor the performance of public schools and students in kindergarten and grades one through 12 to improve and streamline such resources. Ultimately, $92,053 was transferred from the state general fund to NDE for the purpose of developing and carrying out the audit plan. During the robust discussion in this committee on 2019 on the audit results, many of us expressed frustration that the audit did not result in actionable recommendations on ways to reduce the assessments administered in school. One reason for this was the frequency and number of assessments administered at the local level, which are not required by state or federal law. The department responded at the time that it would work with districts to develop a balanced assessment system to help districts reduce formative and interim assessments. Then over the course of the interim, members of the Legislative Committee on Education continued to investigate the amount of instructional time lost to the assessments and talk with the impact about the impact of learning loss had on students. The measure before you today, Senate Bill 353, attempts to address those concerns by requiring NDE to develop regulations to set up guardrails around the amount of time students will undergo testing. At this point, I would like to walk you through the bill itself. Section two requires NDE to review examinations and assessments administered pursuant to chapter 390, testing of pupils and graduation of the Nevada revised statutes for their educational benefits, cost, redundancy and information skills and abilities measured. I would like to point out that NRS uh, 390.800 includes district-based testing. So SB 353 includes any district-based testing within the scope of the testing NDE is required to review in addition to state or federal mandated examinations or assessments. 
Section three requires the NDE to adopt regulations pre prescribing limits on the actual instructional time taken to conduct the assessment and the total number of assessments administered in a school year. Mr. Chair, I am aware that the Department of Ed has submitted a fiscal note of 250,000 to carry out the provisions of this bill. This, co this cost will no doubt be further scrutinized by the Senate Committee on Finance should the bill move forward. I would also like to note that in 2018, when uh, this first amount was requested and authorized, uh, we had different um, administration in the Nevada Department of Ed at that time. And with that, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, this concludes my presentation. I urge your support of Senate Bill 353, which seeks to ma maximize instructional time for our students and reduce the burden of excessive testing. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, uh, Senator um, Dondero is. Um, do you have any other presenters, or is that it? I do not. I I know that the NDE. I'm no doubt online if we have a question, but um, I do not have any other presenters with me today. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I saw. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. I saw. Uh, I was sitting there talking, and I saw. And I, I go, Senator Hammond, and I'm going, Senator Hammond, you're muted. I can't hear you. It's because you didn't hear me. Um, yes, go ahead, Senator Hammond. <laughs> you're muted. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, Madam Vice Chair, just a, a kind of an idea of how this is going to go because I didn't. Uh, I wasn't there for the interim education committee. Uh, so the, basically, the State Department would be tasked with uh, prioritizing. So, for example, uh, the mandated testing at the federal level, would, they, they'd have to look at and see how long that would take. Because we're, we're talking about how many minutes you're out of class or how many minutes you're out of instructional time. Uh, is that correct? Yes. Section three asks them to adopt regulations that prescribe limits on the actual time taken from instruction to conduct an examination or assessment um, pursuant to that chapter. Right, so they would figure out how many minutes, and then and they'd say, okay, so we got to, they got to get to figure out what test that they have to have, uh -huh. uh, and then move from there. And then as soon as they get to a certain time, they say, okay, this is what this is, you know, according to Section Three, this is what we have to have. And then from there, if a district wants to conduct another test, maybe the MAP testing or something else, then they would have to go to the Department of Education, ask for a waiver. And then and then wait for that uh, uh, that uh, or that uh, okay authorization I suppose that's kind of what we'll that's what they're getting at. Correct, Senator Hammond. Um, I mean, we all have to remember that there are some required federal testing. So, um, with that being said, yes, you have given an accurate description. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Other questions. Uh, Senator Buck. Uh, thank you, Chair Dennis and Vice Chair Marilyn Dondera Loop. Thank you so much. Um, I do agree that there is um, sometimes excessive testing in, um, in our schools. A lot of times, though, I see that as state driven. And so um, I'm excited about this bill. So I guess there's no question, but just a comment and thank you for bringing this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Um, if we have no other um, questions, um, then we will go to um, testimony in support opposition and neutral. We will start with first um, hearing testimony in support um, of SB 353. So if BPS could put the first person on that wants to give testimony in support. Thank you, Chair. To testify in support of SB 353, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 577, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chris Daly, D-A-L-Y, Nevada State Education Association, the voice of Nevada educators for over 120 years. And NFDA supports SB 353 requiring the Department of Education review student assessments. 
a top concern of classroom educators has been too many standardized tests, shifting the focus in the classroom away from student learning toward a culture of high stakes testing. NSCA has been actively working to reduce the burden of standardized, standardized testing for a number of years. During the 2017 legislative session, NSCA worked with Senator Woodhouse on SB 303 to require the Department of Education to audit student assessments in order to streamline and make student assessments more efficient. While passed with bipartisan support, the audit was not completed until over a year after its due date. The final report did not follow the requirements contained within SB 303 and was written with a predetermined result in mind that is out of line with the realities in our classrooms. However, the audit did contain some important information about the amount of time educators spend administering assessments with 84% of district test directors spending too much time was spent on the Smarter Balanced Assessment, or SBAC. Responses from those responsible for administration of assessments highlighted the continued need to streamline student assessments. Responses from educators and audit focus groups in, this, in an NSEA internal surveys have been less kind to standardized testing. While small changes to required uh, student assessments have been made over the last several years, a more substantive overhaul of state testing requirements is merited. SB 353 would require the Department of Education to look at the benefits, costs, and any inefficiencies in student assessments and adopt regulations to prescribe limits on the time and number of student assessments. We hope the current department takes this task more seriously this time so we can spend less time testing and more time teaching and learning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. If you recently just joined us, we are currently in support of SB 353. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue to testify in support of SB 353. Chair, you have no more callers in support at this time. Thank you. Let's go to um, testimony in opposition. To testify in opposition of SB 353, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, to testify in opposition of SB 353, please press star nine now. Chair, you have no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. Um, let's go to anyone wishing to testify who is neutral on this bill. To testify neutral on SB 353, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, to testify neutral on SB 353, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no callers neutral at this time. Okay, um, I uh, will go ahead and then come back to um, Senator Don Darrell Loop. Any additional comments? Uh, not any right now, Chair Dennis. I think we've covered it all. It's actually a pretty straightforward bill. So um, I appreciate your time today and uh, we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you, and I, I do want wish to make a, a brief comment. Um, having participated in this in the interim, uh, I think one of the areas that we and somebody just, just reminded me as I heard some of the public comment um, that uh, we do have opportunities perhaps to have some efficiencies when it comes to test taking. Um, and I know the SBAC that we currently offer, um, there is opportunity to actually shorten it. And so I would hope that uh, that the department will look at that as we go. Through, as we've been going through this process and as we're talking about this, um, that they might look at that issue to see if there's a way that we could um, lessen that because I don't think there's a, it, it, it's prescribed to necessarily have to be that, that I think we have some, some efficiencies there that could be done. So with that, I'll go ahead and close um, the hearing on SB 353 and I will then open uh, the hearing on SB 363, and I'm going to turn over the gavel to my vice chair, um, Don Darrell Lou. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and I'll open the hearing on Senate Bill 363. And uh, 
This is also an interim uh, committee bill. So chair, if you'll go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair um, and members of the committee. For the record, I am Senator Mo Dennis representing Senate District 2 in Clark County. I'm here today to present Senate Bill 53, um, which is likely one of the shortest bills that you will read this session. And if you haven't read it yet, you can. I, I will pause for 10 seconds so you can read. <laughs> um, the, uh, um, it, uh, it requires um, charter school governing bodies that enter into contracts with certain organizations to report certain information to the State Public School Authority or the SPCSA. Um, the bill before you today comes as a recommendation from the 2019-2020 Legislative Commission on Education, of which I had the pleasure to serve as vice chair. I'd like to first begin with some brief background information that explains what led to this recommendation. Uh, during the LCE's se September meeting, the executive director of the SPCSA provided the committee with information on the services provided by educational management organizations, or EMOs, to charter schools. These services include academic support, such as professional development or coaching, back office supports, and bundled services, such as human resources, information technology, and payroll and facilities maintenance. The amount paid to EMOs depends on the level of services provided to a school. Testimony indicated that nationally, schools on average pay approximately 12% to EMOs. In Nevada, EMOs report to the governing bodies of charter schools in which they serve, and these bodies evaluate the performance of the EMOs, which may include a review of a school's annual revenue and expenditure report and its financial audits. With that background in mind, now I'd like to cover what SB 363 does. In order to better inform the governing bodies and policymakers of how charter schools are operating with respect to EMOs, SB 363 requires each of Nevada's charter school governing bodies that, uh, that contracts with an EMO to report to the SBCSA the amount paid to the respective management organizations. Senate Bill 363 requires a report to be submitted by November 1st of each even numbered year. I'd like to propose one amendment um, to this bill to change the reporting requirements rather, rather than requiring a charter school governing body that contracts with an EMO to submit a report to the SBCSA, the report would be submitted to the relevant sponsor of the charter school. So in other words, um, not all charter schools are sponsored by the SBCSA. Um, some are sponsored by school districts. So they would, they would whoever sponsors them is that that's who they would give the report to. Um, so in conclusion, uh, Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee, this concludes my presentation. Urge your support of SB 363, which first further supports transparency efforts. I'm happy to answer any questions. I will also note, um, I believe that we have uh, Rebecca Fiden, who is the director of the SBCSA, um, uh, to also either, um, I, I don't know if she has any comments she wants to share, but she's here also to be able to answer any questions that you might that might come up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Vice Chair. Thank you very much. I know when we switch gears, we're not sure whether we're chair or vice chair. Um, I see Senator uh, Danyate. Would you please go ahead? Uh, I think I'm, thank you, Vice Chair Don Darrell. I might be a little bit too early, but uh, considering the simplicity of this bill, uh, I would like to, and the fact that we're getting close to the committee deadline, uh, Chair Dennis, it'd be, I'd be more than welcome to uh, do a motion later on uh, to do pass this um, in work session today, if that's something that you want to do, but I'll let the other committee members. Uh, yeah, Senator Don Donate, that we have to have discussion and take a motion and vote it through. And so, um, and staff always has to have time to prepare documents for a work session. So that I appreciate the, the uh, intent there, but um, probably won't be doing that today. And if that's it, Senator Buck, please go ahead. Yes, um, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Don Deraloop and Chair Dennis. Um, I do like the idea of the transparency of this bill. Um, I'd also like to add, so when you look at charter schools in general, you're right, it's about 12% goes to EMOs. But um, what what's always, I'm always curious because when you look at the actual finances, say district schools, um, what trickles down to the schools is about $4,000 per student. 
and um, which is definitely less than um, what trickles down, or, or I'm sorry, what's definitely more than what trickles down in a charter school. So I think, um, I mean, I would love if we would add something to make district finances a little more transparent too, so that principals running schools and can actually have the funds to do what they need to do. Um, but I'm all for this bill. I guess it's not a question, it's a comment on that. Um, I just, with 33% going and more going to the district as their EMO, uh, it's just always curious to me that why we don't ask for transparency across the board. Thank you very much. Um, I, I actually have a question. I was wondering why this report wasn't going to the Legislative Interim Committee on Education. <clears throat> Madam Chair, I, um, I am not sure. Um, I don't remember if, from what, when we, we talked about this in committee um, why we didn't do that. Right. Perhaps we can explore that in the amendment. Um, uh, and I would, uh, you know, I would also say that while I recognize <clears throat> the transparency issue, EMOs are private corporations, and I think that that's what makes them different. So, um, because public school districts always have to have audits, and those are public knowledge. So um, additional questions from the committee or, oh, Senator Hammond, please. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, to your point right there, I, I did want to ask, and I think Rebecca Fiden, uh, who is on somewhere, she might be able to answer. Uh, transparency is always great. I love the, the fact that we're asking them to submit this to uh, their governing bodies, whether it be the um, the uh, charter authority or the uh, sponsored the, the uh, district sponsored school or district sponsors. Um, the question I would have is, is there anywhere uh, that uh, if somebody could access uh, the information right now? Uh, for example, I know that uh, the charter boards have to meet, they have to have all these discussions. Is all that public? Uh, and where can somebody find it? I mean, I, th I think that if, if if we, we put it this into law, this is great because it's another point where it's there uh, and, and accessible by the public, but is there any place right now where the public can access uh, how much an EMO is receiving from a charter? Um, Ms. Biden, are you on the call? Yes, good afternoon. This is Rebecca Fiden for the record, Executive Director of the State Public Charter School Authority. Um, there is some financial reporting that is provided to sponsors um, through existing regulation. Um, so we do have some of this information. Uh, certainly have, have no hesitation with this being added to statute. Um, and I would imagine some of those reports uh, go through public board meetings. So they may be available uh, through, through a board meeting of a charter school. But in terms of a centralized place, I don't think there would be a centralized place uh, at this point in time. Thank you. So from what I understand, uh, basically, if you wanted to find out um, what is being spent, uh, a, a charter's budget, for example, where the money is being spent, you can access that. It's just maybe not in a central place. And this actually helps us to put it in a central place so it's a little more accessible. Would, you, would, you, would that be a correct characterization, uh, Ms. Fiden? Rebecca Fine for the record, um, I would I would say that um, yes, a lot of the financial documents for our charter schools would be available through their uh, public meetings. However, if you're looking for a centralized place, no, that would not uh, there would not be a centralized place. Again, the state public charter school authority is provided with some of this information. For example, charter school budgets on an annual basis; those are also provided to the Department of Education. Um, so there certainly there's a repository for some of this stuff, but in terms of a public posting or something along those lines, no, uh, not at this point in time. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Hammond. Uh, Madam Vice Chair, you... this is Senator Dennis. Yes, please. Um, I just wanted to also just to add on to that, that I now that I'm thinking about when we had this discussion in the committee, that was the reason, the, the main reason that we brought it forward with these, because some of the information was, and, and it, so this was just kind of put it all in one place in a report and um, make it that much more transparent, more transparent. Thank you. And I, and I would add to that by saying that uh, we have to remember that this is 
public funding that the legislature is responsible for um, uh, allocating. And so that's the other reason that this is so important because when it goes, any time it goes to a private entity, um, it's important for us to know where that funding is going. All right, with that being said, any additional questions or concerns from the committee? Seeing none, Senator Dennis, do you have any additional um, closing comments? Um, I think you need to take a comment. The oh, I'm sorry, comment. you are correct. I am sorry. Um, we will go to support opposition and neutral broadcasting when you're ready. Thank you, Vice Chair. To testify in support of SB 363, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 577, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chris Daly, DALY, Nevada State Education Association, the voice of Nevada educators for over 120 years. NSEA supports SB 363 requiring charter schools to report the amount they pay to educational management organizations. Over the last several years, NSEA has been calling for greater accountability and transparency for charter schools. SB 363 is a small but important reform that will help shine some light on what happens to millions of taxpayer dollars directed to charter schools. We know the explosive growth of charters has been driven by a deliberate billionaire-backed effort to exempt charters from the basic safeguards and standards that apply to our neighborhood public schools. This growth has created an uneven dynamic, undermining local public schools and communities without producing an overall increase in student learning and growth. However, it wasn't until last June when the Nevada Current reported on a dispute between the American Preparatory Academy in Las Vegas and their Utah-based for-profit management organization that we were able to view more of the inner workings of the charter industry. This included large payouts to educational management organizations who uh, this particular charter claim provided little in terms of services and a complicated financial relationship uh, related to charter school facilities. Uh, we hope the committee considers uh, moving forward with SB 363. Uh, thank you. Uh, everyone enjoy your holiday weekend. Thank you. Next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 498. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Erica Valdrez, E-R-I-C-A-V-A-L-D-R-I-Z with the Vegas Chamber. The Chamber is in support of SB 363. The Chamber supports the requirement of each charter school's governing body to submit a report to the state um, public charter school authority. We believe these reports would be would be um, very beneficial when we look in terms of continually progressing our charter schools and its operational performance. These reports will help charter schools governing body to understand the current performance levels, set goals, and evaluate areas to make improvements. This bill will provide transparency and accountability for Nevada students and the state public charter school authority. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee for your time. We urge your support for this bill. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. If you've recently just joined us, we are currently in support of SB 363. To testify in support, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 244, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Victor Salcido, S-A-L-C-I-D-O. I'm with the Charter School Association of Nevada, and we are here today in support of SB 363. Uh, as was mentioned by some of the comments uh, from members of the committee, uh, each public charter school has to pass uh, their budget annually, uh, and sometimes more than annually. Uh, and that is done in a public setting, in a public meeting, uh, subject to open meeting law. So all this information uh, is public, but we are in full support of having a centralized um, place where it could be easily accessible. Um, we're all for transparency and we are in full support of this bill as written. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. Vice <clears throat> nice Chair, you have no more callers in support at this time. Thank you very much. Then we will go to opposition, please. To testify in opposition of SB 363, please press star nine now.
to take your place in the queue. Again, to testify in opposition of SB 363, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Vice Chair, you have no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you very much. We will go to neutral. To testify neutral on SB 363, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, to testify neutral on SB 363, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no callers neutral at this time. Thank you very much. And we will go back to uh, Senator Dennis to see if that is any closing remarks. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, you know, this this uh, um, this bill will allow us to have continue to, to do the things that we've been trying to do to create more transparency in education and education funding, uh, which we started with, the you know, with the new funding formula, as well as other things that we're doing uh, to make it so that everyone can see what we're doing in education. So um, urge your support. Thank you, Madam Chair. Vice Chair. Thank you very much, um, Senator Dennis. And with that, I'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 363 and hand the gavel back over to Chair Dennis. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Senator Lang. Senator Dennis, um, on Senate Bill 193, I voted no to reserve my right. I think I really meant to vote yes and reserve my right. So I'm wondering if you could open the hearing so that I might recast my vote. Yeah, let me, yeah, we've got time. So let me, uh, let me just uh, check with staff how, um, I believe I just have to open the hearing back up. Is that correct, Mr. Killian or Ms. Sturm? Mr. Chair, I should thank committee counsel. Um, yes, you're certainly welcome to, um, I, I think the appropriate motion would be a move to um, rescind the previous vote and then open um, the vote for a new roll call since the vote was concluded and a decision was announced. Okay, great, thank you. Um, since we do have, a, uh, we're, we're still waiting on our next presenter, I, I will, uh, um, would you like to make a motion to rescind the previous action and reconsider? I think is probably what, what he just said. Yes, I move that to, re what is it again? <laughs> reconsider the reconsider the vote on SB 193. Thank you. And to, res uh, to rescind, I think there was a rescind in all of that. To, and to rescind the vote and reconsider it. I move to rescind the vote or rescind the motion and re-vote on Senate Bill 193. Okay, does that work, Mr. Killian? Is that a hand? A, okay. That works for me, sir. <laughs> okay. okay, good. Thank you. Do I have a second? <laughs> Senator uh, Donate is seconding. Um, okay, on that motion, um, we need to take a vote. Oh wait, further discussion? Okay, um, it, so then we'll take a vote. So if Secretary could call a vote on, so right now we're just voting on the motion to reconsider, basically. Vice Chair Dondero Loop. Yes. Senator Hardy. Senator Hammond? Yes, I think. Senator Lang? Yes. Senator Buck? Yes. Senator Donate? Yes. Senator uh, Chair Dennis? Yes. Senator Hardy? So now, oh, sorry. I don't want to leave him out of the vote. Is he, uh, do we know if he's just temporarily not there? But I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm okay with the, on this vote. Um, let's go ahead and, and uh, the, the vote uh, passes. Um, uh, so I could, um, I'd be glad to now uh, 
take a motion to to uh, move uh, amend and do pass. Senator, Senator Hardy, do you want to record your vote? We were, we were voting to rescind the previous action on SB 193. 193. I I still like my bill. Yes. Okay. So so we're, we're going to do it again. We're just doing it so Senator Lyon can can change your vote. So um, all right. So if you would record um, Senator Hardy also in support of the uh, rescinding. Uh, so then now I need a motion to, um, uh, Senator Lang, you wanna do a motion to, to uh, amend and do pass? I move that we amend and do pass Senate Bill 193. I Senator second. Uh, okay, who was that? Uh, Senator Buck, okay. Senator Buck made the second. Any further discussion? Okay. So now we'll take the vote. Um, if the secretary could call a roll call vote. Vice Chair Dundero Loop. Yes. Senator Hardy. Yes. Senator Hammond. Yes. Senator Lang. Senator Buck. Yes. Senator Donate? Yes. Chair Dennis? Yes. Senator Lang? You're muted. You're still muted. Ma'am, I already voted. Would you like me to vote again? You were muted when you voted before, so we oh. didn't hear you. That's why. Okay. Uh, yes. And I reserve my right and thank you for your indulgence. Thank you. All right, so everybody's voted, uh, motion carries. Um, all right, so now um, we are um, going to hear um, SB 347. However, I believe that the presenter, Senator Scheibel is in the middle of a um, work session. So I think she just needs a, a minute to, uh, so, so we're gonna be, Let's see, unless I see her pop up here, I'm going to, um, oh, there she is. We'll wait for her to connect audio. I was going to take a break, but since she's here, I want to keep going. I'm here. Oh, perfect. Are you so talking about me? Yeah, so we're, we are, uh, um, we, we were going to take a break, but you, you actually popped on the screen right before I did. So um, we are um, now going to hear SB 347 which revises provisions governing sexual misconduct in institutions of the Nevada system of higher education. And we have Senator Scheibel to um, do the presentation. So I will turn that over to you. Thank you so much, Chair Dennis. For the record, my name is Melanie Scheibel. I am the state Senator from District 9. I appreciate all of you being here today uh, to hear this bill and your patience with me as I wrap up a work session um, in Senate Judiciary. Uh, Senate Bill 347 has been a long effort over the course of the last 18 months with um, over a thousand students in the Nevada University systems of higher education uh, to come up with policies that make sense for Nevada students in order to ensure their safety on campus um, and when they are in school. We have worked alongside numerous organizations um, and across all kinds of um, educational institutions in a completely bipartisan or nonpartisan way, and I'm very proud of the bill that uh, we brought before you. There is an amendment to it, um, which I was just checking to make sure was posted on Nellis, and it is. And um, you'll see that there are some significant changes in the conceptual amendment from the original bill. I'm sure you can all uh, relate to the experience of working with our amazing staff at LCB who have been completely overburdened for the last few weeks. And so while we continue to talk about the language, LCB continued to try to write the language and um, we didn't want to put this on them while they were still trying to uh, write bills for us. So um, I hope that you've all had a chance to review the conceptual amendment. And if not, it is on Nellis now. And that is the document that we will be working from. I am going to uh, turn this presentation over because this truly um, is not my brainchild, but is the brainchild of the Nevada students who felt that there was more that we could be doing here in the state to protect students um, from violence on campus and especially sexual violence. And so the first person uh, who is going to present an overview 
is Ms. Lily James from the Every Voice Coalition, and I will hand it over to her now. Thank you so much, Senator Scheibel. For the record, Lily, L-I-L-Y, James, J-A-M-E-S. Um, Chair Dennis and distinguished members of the Education Committee, it is truly a privilege to be here with you today. My name is Lily Bone James, and I'm a senior in college at Mount Holyoke College, and I serve as co-executive director of the Every Voice Coalition, which is a student and survivor-led organization working to write, file, and fight for student and survivor written legislation to prevent campus sexual violence and support survivors. Hello, everyone. My name is Geneva Wolf. I am a sophomore at the University of Nevada, Reno, and Lily and I join you today to present on SB 347. And for the purpose of this presentation, we are working from the amended version of SB 347. Before we begin today's presentation, I would like to give a blanket contents warning that we will be discussing sexual violence, including statistics. I want to begin today with some context and background on the bill. Since last June, Nevada college students have been researching, talking to dozens of stakeholders, sourcing thousands of student voices, and ultimately writing SB 347, which is before you today. Um, Nevada students have worked with countless organizations, including the Nevada Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence, the National Women's Law Center, ACLU Nevada, and so many more. Students have tirelessly organized their peers, engaging with over 2,000 students over the past nine months. We've listened to stories of students and survivors whose voices are too often silenced, pushed aside, or forgotten. And I would encourage the committee members to read the submitted written testimonies and public opinion forms and endorsements from the countless students and student groups, including Greek life organizations, student governments, clubs, and many others across the state who support this bill and are unfortunately in class at the moment and unable to join us live. To put this bill in a broad context, I want to share some of what we know about the epidemic of sexual violence on college campuses. One in 10 students will experience campus sexual violence during their time in college. This includes one in five women and other students with intersecting marginalized identities. One in 10 students. With over 118,000 college students in Nevada this year, that means there are more like, likely more than 12,000 current Nevada students who've experienced sexual violence. And again, that 12,000 only accounts for the current college students and doesn't take into account any of the previous generations of students to come before us. Consider how large that number is. Thinking about those young Nevadans and the millions of past students who've experienced violence, According to statistics gathered about the aftermath of sexual assault, less than 50% of survivors cite receiving any support post-assault. 94% experience PTSD in the two weeks following their assault. 38 of all assault victims experience work or school problems. A staggering 34% of survivors will actually drop out and never finish school after an assault. And studies show that there is a direct correlation between women who experience sexual violence while they're in college and the negative impacts on their education, career, and trajectory of earnings afterwards. This ultimately results in devastating economic impacts. Um, studies estimate that all survivors assaulted as young adults experience a lifetime economic loss of over $241,000. We have a dangerous epidemic on our hands that, is too, that too often leaves millions of students in the US every year with lifelong trauma and diminished personal or professional growth that is crucial to have during college. And these rates of sexual violence have stayed stagnant since it was first documented in 1983. Yes, we've known about the widespread and deeply horrific um, epidemic of sexual violence for nearly 40 years. And each year we've chosen not to address this which means millions of students have unnecessarily experienced this violence. As a current UNR student, I cannot express how vital this piece of legislation is for the future of my campus. SB 347 would lead our state on a track that prioritizes the physical, mental, and emotional safety of all students. It would be part of the growing movement to change societal norms that allow for sexual violence to affect our loved ones' lives. This bill would address the lack of adequate resources and outreach for students like myself at NC institutions, something that has been incredibly apparent in my two years at UNR. 
Committee members, my heart breaks to inform you of this, but I cannot count the number of friends who have confided in me about their experience being raped, sexually assaulted, or harassed, and they are not alone. Again, my heart breaks, and for two reasons. One, the immense pain that I feel for these countless survivors, some of whom are my closest friends, and two, for the anger I have that our institutions in Nevada and in the United States of America have not done more to protect the people. We've not been more preventative of what's happened to over 12,000 current students in Nevada who have experienced sexual violence. This, the time is now to stop simply being reactive to this urgent issue and to start being proactive. Lawmakers, we must act now. The facts, statistics, and stories are clearly laid out in front of us. I am so deeply grateful to Senator Scheibel and the dozens of other Nevada legislators, including all of you on the committee here today, for saying that enough is enough and we need to address this dangerous problem. Furthermore, we need to listen to the voices of students and survivors on what they're saying they need after experiencing firsthand campus sexual violence. Our state may be small, but we are powerful, and I believe we can be a leading figure in the fight to end this epidemic that is sexual violence. Thank you for your time and energy on this bill that will improve the lives of so many Nevadans. Chair Dennis and members of the Education Committee, please vote SB 347 out of committee, into session, and into action for the people of Nevada. Our students are counting on you. And I will now hand it over to Lily to present the key components of the amended version of the bill. Thank you, Geneva. Um, committee members, SB 347 has several crucial components that work to both prevent campus sexual violence and support survivors. All of these components come from dozens of conversations and working sessions with students and young alumni, survivors and allies, researchers, administrators, legislators, rape, rape crisis centers, nonprofit leaders, and advocates. Additionally, such similar, member, uh, similar measures have been passed into law in New Hampshire this past summer and Massachusetts this past January. So these components are best practice ways to ensure that we support all survivors at the same time that we actively work to, per, um, to prevent violence. So this, some of the key components of the bill um, include memorandums of understanding with uh, local rape crisis centers and universities. We know that, again, less than 50% of survivors cite receiving any support services post-assault. SB 347 requires institutions to establish and maintain an MOU with a rape crisis center or domestic violence center. These centers can provide free off-campus medical, legal, and counseling resources and supports for students and employees and insist in developing trauma-informed institutional policies, programming, and training. The next component of the bill is victim advocates. We know that 90% of survivors choose not to file a report after their assault. Many survivors cite a lack of knowledge of options available to them as a barrier for seeking help, and we need to break down that barrier. SB 347 requires institutions to designate at least one victim advocate who can advise students about reporting options, on and off campus resources, and provide support and accommodation. Importantly, the victim advocate does not refer cases to Title IX or other disciplinary processes without permission from the reporting party so that it never leaves the hands of the survivor. And the victim advocate has privilege under the law to ensure complete confidentiality and being someone that the victim or survivor can, try and can, always, can always count on. The third component is an amnesty policy. We know that survivors often cite fear of retaliation or punishment due to alcohol consumption or drug use or other code violations at the time of an incident as a reason they choose not to report their assault. SB 347 requires that all institutions comply with an amnesty policy, so that per that which prevents reporting policy parties or bystanders from being penalized for use of alcohol or drugs or other code violations at the time of an incident to ensure that there is no barrier for students when seeking support or help. Um, additionally, as detailed in the proposed amendment, there are also added measures to ensure that if and when a survivor pursues a case, there is a bare minimum requirement for the process to not be overly traumatizing for anyone involved. Next, we have our camp, uh, sexual assault cli campus climate survey. Um, we know that in 2016, the same year that the Every Voice Coalition was founded, 
89% of colleges and universities across the country reported zero cases of rape on campus. So there must be a consistent and reliable way to collect data that we currently do not have so that we can really know what is happening on our campuses and then work to address them. SB 347 creates a task force of diverse stakeholders, including crucially students, which is responsible for writing the base set of questions for higher education institutions climate surveys. Institutions have the option to use the base survey, add any other school specific questions, or substitute in a previously used survey if it is deemed up to the standard of the base survey to both ensure that there is consistency but flexibility. Institutions must conduct the survey of all students biannually every two years and post the findings on the institution's website and in a statewide data repository, which can help ensure transparency. With more reliable data, students can be uh, schools can better know how to combat the issue on their campus and better support their students. Lastly, annual prevention training. We know that more frequent trainings are often cited as a crucial step to creating a, a safe campus culture, and the majority of schools only do one training for, uh, throughout their whole uh, throughout a student's entire time in uh, college. SB three four seven requires institutions to provide annual annual mandatory sexual misconduct prevention and awareness training um, for all students and employees to make sure that everyone in a campus community is informed as well as aware of the resources that are available to them through this bill. Nevada now has the opportunity to join just a handful of other states as leaders not only in our standard for higher education but in setting, in setting the standard for addressing this epidemic that again we have the power to prevent Help us and other Nevada students across the entire state keep our peers and loved ones safe. Thank you, committee, for your time and for your support of Nevada survivors and students. Geneva and I are here and happy to answer any questions from the committee. Thank you. Um, questions? Uh, Senator Buck. Thank you, Chair Dennis, and thank you, uh, ladies, um, so much. Again, th this is near and dear to my heart. I know that uh, Selena Torres has sponsored a bill. It's AB 3 384, I believe. Um, she has been working you know, with stakeholders from Nevada institutions for, I guess, the past um, near, nearly a year. And so what I'm wondering is, how, has your organization reached out to uh, Nevada institutions of higher learning um, to get their input? Thank you so much, Senator Buck, for that question. I really appreciate that. Um, we have done, and I really can't actually tell you the number of conversations we've had with a wide array of stakeholders, um, you know, including students, survivors, um, you know, local nonprofits. Um, uh, you know, rape crisis centers, et cetera. Um, we've also had um, a conversation with some uh, representatives from NG. Um, and, uh, you know, most importantly, though, we have uh, really sourced the voices of students um, who are really making sure that this bill is representing the direct needs of Nevada students. So I really appreciate your question. I'll just follow and up and indicate that um, this is Melanie Scheibel for the record. I also spoke to a representative from NSHE um, just yesterday, and we're meeting again over the weekend to discuss the bill in further detail. They are supportive of the legislation. Um, I think they're also available to answer some questions for us today. Uh, we weren't quite sure what time we would get on the calendar, so I don't want to misrepresent their position, but um, we have been working closely with them and we continue to work with them. Thank you, um, Senator Scheibel. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Senator Dondero Luke. Thank you, Senator Scheibel and um, ladies to, for joining us today. Um, Senator Scheibel, you uh, uh, when you started, you referenced a, an amendment. Um, I don't have that right in front of me. I'm sorry. But could you tell us, um, or is that amendment in process? And if it is, it is fine. You don't have to do that. I was just wondering if you had an amendment that you could share with us. The amendment is posted now on Nellis under the exhibits. Um, and it, it does make significant changes to the bill 
from a language perspective and a um, legal perspective, the five major components that Ms. James already pointed to remain the same. The, the core of the policy remains the same. And I actually do want to note that the reason that we have such a, an extensive amendment is that we worked with so many coalitions. We worked with the Know Your Nine campaign. We worked with um, the Women's Law Center. We worked with the Rape Crisis Center. We worked with the Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. And um, I think in a process that normally happens much later in session, the, those groups have actually gone through line by line to discuss specific language and specific, um, you know, subsections and things like that. So some of that is also just kind of a change in the structure of the bill that doesn't change what it does, doesn't change those five core values, but it does address concerns like that, for instance, the Rape Crisis Center had about the way that they provide services. And so now it conforms with um, all of those organizations perspectives. Thank and of you. course, I'm happy to talk more about it. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other, <clears throat> other questions? Senator Donate. Thank you, Chair Dennis and Senator Scheibel. Uh, I commend you and your stakeholders for putting forward this long overdue legislation that uh, should have been in conversation a very long time ago. Uh, I just have a quick question on Section 30. Um, how have the institutions responded to the fines that result um, if the college or institution doesn't follow the regulations? Have you faced pushback on that? Or maybe there is a way that like when when the institution gets hit with that $150,000 fine, maybe that, that money can go towards uh, campus prevention efforts or uh, maybe other nonprofits to teach them a lesson as to why they need to comply. Is that, has, has that conversation been had or? That's pretty much it. Thank you so much, Senator Donato, for that question. Um, so that uh, fine is actually really crucial to this bill um, to make sure that there is you know, accountability on this. Um, that number comes from um, federal best practices um, and you know, has been also refined to make sure that it's appropriate for Nevada. Um, and I will also say that like, you know, a core component of that is that there's reasonable notice and opportunity for hearing. And, you know, we're not looking for this to be something that's, um, you know, slapped on unnecessarily, more to just ensure that there is, you know, accountability that, you know, these students, uh, you know, are really asking for. Um, we have not heard anything in opposition for uh, that, that fine or for that number specifically. Um, uh, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, other questions? Uh, Senator Buck. Thank you, Chair Dennis, if I may ask one more. Um, so why, I guess in the technical um, technicalities of the bill, why would the task force, task force be under the AG's office? Um, isn't it the intent of Title IX to be separate from the court process? Um, that's a great question, Senator Buck. Thank you so much. Um, so actually, this bill uh, does sort of exist outside of the bounds of Title IX, and the, um, the task force specifically is only responsible for the section of the bill that relates to the um, climate survey. So there's no other part of the bill that, you know, it really has any, uh, you know, hands in. Um, and so that climate survey, uh, you know, is not uh, related to any sort of process or disciplinary, um, you know, action or anything else. So it really does um, act separately. And we don't think that that would be too much of an issue. Thank you. And Chair Dennis, if I may do a follow up. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Dennis. So another, so uh, you referenced the climate survey, which I know because I've done a lot of surveys um, that they can be very um, leading in questions. So I just wondered uh, why the task force would be established to create the climate survey. It would seem that it would be uh, much more in, in much more better hands with like say survey researchers or um, you know unbiased um, entities. So if you could refer that. Thank you so much, Senator Buck. Um, so yeah, so the task force of the um, that creates the campus climate survey is actually really integral to this bill for a couple reasons. Um, what you pointed to is really important to us too. Um, on the list of 
uh, who sits on that task force. Um, there are researchers, there are folks who are um, data professional, uh, you know, data analyst professionals, people who are, um, you know, really uh, experienced with and, um, you know, knowledgeable about task force creation and, you know, how to phrase questions, et cetera. Um, and um, it also brings together a really diverse group of, um, you know, other stakeholders. Um, and I will also mention, including students, which is really important for us that, you know, once this bill becomes um, a law, hopefully soon, um, the students do not lose uh, any sort of voice in this um, that they've been, you know, using throughout this advocacy process. Um, so we think that it sort of does a, a good job of balancing both, um, where, you know, it has those experts um, who, you know, in data collection, and it has the folks who are experts in, you know, the lived experience of the students and what students need on campus right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have you seen AB 384, Selena Torres' bill? Yes, Senator Buck, I have. Thank you. Thank you. I got. A, I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, in Section 29 um, of the amendment, um, it talks about um, school school sponsored programs, activities, including scholarships, state based scholarships, and grants, promise scholarships with any with minimum GPA credit or other academic requirement. So, waiving that, um, how would that work when, like, because I, you know, I, I worked on promise scholarship. Promise doesn't require a GPA. To get it, but you have to maintain a GPA because you're you're you're, you're getting a Pell grant, and so it's federally required. Um, so how would this work with those types of federal requirements that are required in some of our state scholarships um, because of you know because of those federal requirements? Thank you, Chair Dennis. Um, I'm happy to take that question as well. Um, so this uh, section, I will just give a little bit of background on Section 29 um, of the amendment. Um, this really came from a lot of conversations with students and survivors who, um, you know, as we mentioned, often experience um, immense, um, uh, you know, uh, difficulty, uh, you know, getting schoolwork done or, you know, staying in class. Um, oftentimes, if the perpetrator is, you know, in the same class as them or, you know, down the hall or, you know, whatever else. Um, and so wanting to just make sure that there is flexibility within the system to make sure that um, when accommodations are necessary, it's not an undue burden on um, anybody to receive those, especially after a traumatic incident. Um, so I just sort of wanted to give some context for that um, section. And that did come from a lot of conversations with other advocacy groups as well as students and survivors. So we're really proud of that um, section as well. Um, but to your uh, question specifically, um, I you know, frankly don't know uh, the um, state versus federal. Um, my, you know, uh, I, with the intention of this section, um, it would only be as it relates to, you know, state level, um, uh, you know, uh, requirements. Um, but I think the overall intent of it is to um, allow for there to be some context um, of, you know, for why, uh, you know, GPA, uh, you know, lowered and have an opportunity for students to, um, you know, give an explanation um, if they were experiencing trauma after an incident. So, um, you know, the, you know, Overall, it's just providing, uh, it's not as black or white. Um, you know, did you get a certain GPA? Did you not? Um, you know, if you didn't get a certain GPA, you have an, you have the opportunity to explain. Um, and it's not as sort of stressful or an undue burden on the survivor. So, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, and I get, I, I get it and makes sense that why you would want to do that. My only concern would be that I wouldn't want them to lose the scholarship because they didn't have the GPA and, and, and the federal didn't offer a, a waiver. Um, and yet, in our legis in our, in our statutes, we might require the GPA because of that, because we want them to have the the uh, um, to be able to get the federal one, because it, some of our scholarships are based on our last dollar scholarships, so they need to get the. Otherwise, there's a fiscal impact um, if, if we do that. So we we want to make sure that we check that that there's no issues there, because we don't want to have that fiscal impact and don't want them to lose their scholarships. Um, this is Melanie Scheibel for the record, and I'll just say that I appreciate that, Chair Dennis. I think it's a good flag for us to keep in mind as we continue to work with stakeholders on this, and um, we'll be sure that we uh, we craft the language in a way that is best for students. Thank you. Okay, and and um, just one, uh, Senator Hammond, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a quick question, and then I'll just throw it out to whoever wants to answer this. 
it looks like you have uh, made some changes to section eight. Uh, some of the language has been uh, stricken from uh, the original and some other things in here, sexual misconduct conduct means, and then you go on to explain a little bit. Uh, can, you, can you give me a little bit more background on this? Tell me why you struck some of the language. Tell me what you were expecting out of this. Uh, do you think perhaps it might be too broad? Um, are you trying to narrow it down a little bit so um, that we have a better idea of what, what, you know, both, you know, what everybody knows or expects out of this? Can you just tell me a little bit more about that section? Senator Hammond, I really appreciate that question. Um, that uh, definition is one that I will say, probably of all the definitions, we've worked really the hardest on to make sure that it is, um, you know, as inclusive as possible. Um, I will say from my experience, one of the things that we often see is that students will, you know, worry about, oh, my, you know, case or what happened to me doesn't fall under the definition of, you know, what I would be able to be protected from or what I will I be able to get supports from. Um, and that is often a barrier um, and any sort of ambiguity, um, you know, that exists in that. So by making it, um, you know, as using the definition of sexual misconduct as an intentionally broad term that includes, um, you know, all of the, um, uh, you know, parts of the definition is really with the intention of making sure that no student feels like what happened to them doesn't apply or they don't, you know, that's not legit because it wasn't, um, you know, falling under the definition and they're not sort of, um, you know, further cut out because that's um, any sort of barrier. Thank you. I appreciate that. But as a follow up, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, I kind of want to get an idea because you said it's, it's, you wanted to make it intentionally broad and making sure you include a lot of other um, uh, incidences in this uh, particular definition. Uh, so obviously, we, you know, I think for the last 40 years, people have said this enough is enough on, on college campuses. Uh, we're seeing an escalation of uh, rape and uh, a date rape and, uh, you know, a lot of other things that are going on and nobody seems to be get, getting, you know, control of that. Uh, and so that's one thing. And you were, you were mentioning, I think, in your opening statement, uh, something about 12,000 current victims. Um, you know, if we have 12,000 current victims at, uh, under one definition in this right here, I guess I'm trying to figure out, can you tell me an example of somebody who might come to you and say, I didn't think I fit under that category. I didn't think I fit under that definition, but under this definition, they would fit. Can you, can you give me a, a, a scenario in, in which I would understand now why you would, why you need to expand this? Maybe two examples. Yeah, I really appreciate that question, Senator Hammond. Um, the one that is coming to mind is the um, inclusion of domestic violence under this term. Um, you know, that's in particularly important to make sure that if there are, um, you know, uh, students who are in long-term relationships or, um, you know, married at the time that they're in, um, in college, they don't, um, you know, feel like, uh, you know, because what happened to them wasn't a stranger at a party, um, you know, that doesn't uh, feel like that falls in the definition, but it is, if they're, it is their spouse or their, you know, long-term partner um, or, you know, someone who would fit under that definition um, more specifically, making sure that there is not, um, you know, any ambiguity about making sure that they're able to um, receive accommodation. That's the, that's the one that's coming to mind now, but happy to follow up with you if you'd like um, further examples. Uh, yeah, is, thank you. Oh, go ahead. This is Melanie Scheibel for the record. I'll also add, this isn't exactly your question, but I think this is where maybe where you're headed, um, is that the provisions of this bill are intended to apply to a spectrum of situations. We're not talking about taking the same approach to every single case. We're not saying that now we're going to treat cases of sexual harassment the same way that we treat cases of sexual assault. We're saying that we want one unified system so that when a victim doesn't know where they fall on that spectrum, they know the place to go. Because part of the problem that's happening right now is that people, victims, survivors, don't have the same view of that spectrum that maybe law enforcement or their campus community coordinator or a healthcare provider might have. And so they are erring on the side of believing that they are not included in the definition instead of believing that they are. So it's not that we're saying that you know, we want to start treating, you know, even perpetrators of sexual harassment the way that we treat perpetrators of sexual assault, but to say that those two people should go through the same process to talk to their campus security, to talk to their campus advocate, to talk to a doctor if they need to, or a counselor if they need to, and that the other student, um, this, is, this is all non-disciplinary. So this is about providing all students with more access to more resources to prevent violence, either as survivors or perpetrators. And we're saying that, um, you know, 
now, whereas maybe it used to be that there was nothing we could do about a less severe harassment incident, now the task, now the office is going to have a, a broader policy that says, okay, here's our response to that. We have, we can offer you as a survivor something, or even you as a perpetrator, we can offer um, a, a, a training, a leadership course, um, a, a lecture, and I don't mean lecture like a finger wagging lecture, but like an academic lecture series um, for all kinds of um, sexual and domestic violence. Thank you. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, release my time uh, here. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, I don't, I don't see any other questions at this point. Um, so let's go on then to, uh, to hear testimony of those in support, opposition, and neutral um, on Senate Bill 347. Um, and uh, first, we will hear testimony in support. So BPS can please add the first caller. Thank you, Chair. To testify in support of SB 347, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 540, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 540, we can see you are unmuted. Can you please begin your testimony? Moving on to the next caller, we will try them later. Oh, oh. let's try one more time. Caller with the last four digits of 540, please press star six now to unmute yourself. Good afternoon, Chair Dennis, members of the committee. My apologies for my technical difficulties. My name is Serena Evans, spell S-E-R-E-N-A-E-V-A-N-S. And I'm the policy specialist for the Nevada Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. And we are so excited to be here today in strong support of Senate Bill 347. I want to first start by thanking Senator Scheibel and the Every Voice Coalition for bringing this important bill forward. The Every Voice Coalition reached out to us very early on in the interim, and it has been an absolute pleasure to work with them. And the students' dedication to this legislation is truly commendable. Nevada needs this legislation not only in my professional capacity, but also as a survivor of campus sexual assault here in Nevada, I know the importance that this bill will have for Nevada students. College-aged adults have the highest risk for sexual assault with an estimated 25% of college females and five to 6% of males experiencing some form of sexual violence during their time at a four-year institution. However, what is even more staggering is that the U.S. Justice Department estimates that less than 5% of these sexual assaults are reported to the campus or community law enforcement. With college-age individuals experiencing the highest rates of sexual assault, it only makes sense that our NC campuses put into practice, practice the support and resources that are proven to increase positive outcomes for victim survivors. Speaking from experience, sexual assault is incredibly isolating. And had I felt that my campus had these supports in place, I would have been more likely to come forward and seek out the resources and support that I truly needed at the time. Victim survivors are suffering not only physical and emotion, emotional harm, but also harm to their ability to fully engage in their academic experiences. It is so imperative that colleges are open about sexual assault. It is no longer the time to be hush-hush about the sexual assault experiences of students. When colleges report zero instances of sexual assault, victim survivors are further isolated and feel they have nowhere to turn. By ENSHE adopting these rules, providing victim survivors with resources, and collecting data, our higher edu education campuses in Nevada can prove that they are not only tackling the epidemic of sexual assault, but are taking it seriously. We urge you to pass Senate Bill 374 to help protect victim survivors on our college campuses throughout Nevada. Thank you so much. Thank you for going to Thank the next you, caller. one. Oh, I'm sorry, Chair. Caller with the last three digits of 594. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Kev Kevin Finkler, F-I-N-K-L-E-R. Today, I'll be representing myself as a student and also as president of Alpha Sigma Phi fraternity here at the University of Nevada Reno campus. 
To the committee members, thank you for allowing us to come in today and speak. The men of Alpha Sigma Phi at the University of Nevada, Reno, wish to submit this letter of endorsement in collaboration with our fellow fraternities and Greek life here on campus and the local organization Every Voice NV for the NV for the Every Voice Nevada bill currently proposed as 347 for your consideration. It is the value of Alpha Sigma Phi nationally that we support the survivors of sexual violence and advocate for changes that end these horrific acts. As students of the University of Nevada, Reno, we believe that the item, items listed in the bill are essential and needed for our fellow students. The inclusion of such things as sexual misconduct climate surveys, a task force on sexual misconduct, victim advocates, annual awareness program and training, data reporting requirements, and all of the listed is in this bill, we believe as members of our fraternity and the university are essential to ensuring that students on this campus feel safe. We are form, firm in the belief that no person should have to go through life with fear of sexual violence and fear that no resources are available if such an act were to occur. All these reasons listed above and many others are the reason we write this letter today. Our men encourage all the members of the Nevada State Legislature to take the proposed bill on the docket as serious and with overwhelming support from students of this state's higher education institutions. We ask that you pass this bill in the hopes that the items and actions listed may make real changes in students' lives, ensure that no one attending an institution of higher education in the state ever goes through the pain that far too many before have had to endure. Sincerely, the men of Alpha Sigma Phi. I would like to end with a personal note that I myself have experience the pain that was discussed earlier from other students and seeing the pain, anguish, and sadness in the eyes of our fellow students here at the university that have gone through similar situations and have felt powerless and without any resources. And I'm strongly, strongly encouraging you to take this first step of action. This is not the only step, but is the first step of action to hopefully begin to make our state feel safe and especially our institutions of higher education. I thank you for your time and hope you will strongly consider voting in favor of this bill. Thank you. Let's go to the next one. Caller with the last three digits of 786. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Malia Blunt, M-A-L-I-A-B-L-U-N-T. Chair members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Malia Blunt and I have grown up in Las Vegas for the majority of my life. I am here today to give my full support to SB 347. My parents did their best to prepare me for the dangers of being a woman in society, which meant being cautious of where I walk, what I wear, and how to avoid situations of sexual assault. Parents tried their best, but no amount of advice could protect me from being catcalled or touched inappropriately by men of all ages. And it certainly did not prepare me for what to do if friends came to me looking for support after being assaulted. As a college student and black woman, I can firmly say that SB 347 is a bill survivors need. According to the American Psychological Association, one in four black girls will be sexually assaulted by the age of 18. And for every black woman who reports rape, at least 15 will not come forward. These statistics are jarring and deeply unsettling but only further emphasize the need for a bill that protects survivors and guarantees them a safe space to receive counseling and support after their abuse. We need SB 347, and with your support, we can protect survivors of sexual abuse. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 985. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. Hi, this is, this is Elizabeth Tang, E-L-I-Z-A-B-E-T-H, last name T-A-N-G. Chair Dennis and distinguished members of the Education Committee, my name is Elizabeth Tang, and I'm here on behalf of the National Women's Law Center, founded in 1972, the same year that Title IX was enacted. Since then, we have worked to address sex discrimination in schools and have participated in every major Title IX case before the Supreme Court. Today, I'm testifying in favor of SB 347 with the suggested amendments because sexual misconduct pushes too many students out of higher education, including in Nevada. Sexual assault affects one in four women, according to the latest survey, and one in 15 men during their time in college. 
Dating and domestic violence affect one in three college women and one in six college men. These numbers are often even higher for black and brown students, LGBTQ students, and students with disabilities. But sexual misconduct is also vastly underreported. Nine in 10 college students do not report their assaults to their schools. And even when they do come forward, many survivors are ignored or punished instead of being helped. Because schools are not doing enough to address sexual misconduct, more than one in three survivors end up dropping out of college. Under SB 347, the Board of Regents could require NG institutions to provide a wide range of supportive measures to student survivors to help them stay in school, to provide prevention and awareness training for students and staff, to survey students about their experiences with sexual misconduct, and to submit annual data about sexual misconduct to the board. The board could also prohibit schools from punishing student survivors for ancillary behavior, like using drugs or alcohol during a sexual assault, so that survivors are not afraid of coming forward to ask for help. Over the past few months, the National Women's Law Center has been working with Nevada State advocates and student survivors to suggest the conceptual amendments mentioned by Senator Scheibel that would make SB 347 even stronger, like requiring schools to use fair and trauma-informed reporting and investigation procedures and helping survivors whose grades have suffered as a result of the trauma to keep their scholarships. I urge you to adopt these amendments and to vote this bill favorably out of committee as soon as possible. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 319. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Alia Epstein, A-L-I-Y-A. E-P-S-T-E-I-N. Hello, Chair Dennis and members of the committee. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. My name is Aaliyah Epstein, and I'm a born and raised Nevadan and a college student, as well as an advocate with the Every Voice Coalition. I came today to speak in full support of SB 347 because I had no idea how crippling the epidemic of sexual violence was on a college campus. I had no idea how painful it would feel when I realized how close sexual violence was to me and how many people I love had, have had trauma related to sexual violence, and I definitely had no idea how, diff how difficult it would be to work with my university to try to get the help and support that survivors needed. We need college students to have access to resources such as the Universal Climate Survey so that they can be aware of what's happening on their campus and be prepared. We need victim advocates so all survivors can have full knowledge of the resources at their disposal and the paths that are available. We need amnesty policies so that students feel safe coming forward and comfortable with the processes that they are not working to against them, or working against them. Our students need SB 347 and they deserve to feel safe and protected on their campus. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 956. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon and thank you, Chair. For the record, this is Liz Davenport, L-I-Z-D-A-V-E-N-P-O-R-T, on behalf of the ACLU of Nevada in support of SB 347. Thank you, Senator Scheibel, for bringing this bill. When students experience sexual violence, it deprives them of equal and free access to education, and this is a pressing civil rights issue. Young adults between 18 and 34 are at the highest risk of sexual violence, representing 54% of sexual assault cases. As Mrs. Wolf described, the statistics for sexual violence of students and the lifelong effect it has on them is devastating. Further, these effects disproportionately impact people of color and marginalized and vulnerable populations. After experiencing sexual violence, it is crucial to receive support and receive information about what resources are available. Reactions to sexual violence vary, but many times include impacts to your ability to attend classes, but psychological trauma and health and safety concerns, along with self-blame, feeling shame, and fear of getting in trouble themselves. It is vital to provide these students with success in the future and giving them information and an advocate that can guide them towards resources to help is key component to future success. It's also vital that barriers to reporting or seeking resources are removed. 90% of those that experience sexual violence do not report. Removing a fear of getting in trouble because drugs or alcohol was present is important to get bystanders or self-reporters to seek help. It's a natural part of attending university to meet other students and gather together. 
Removing the fear of reprisal and conducting annual prevention training is important to creating a culture where students feel more comfortable seeking assistance. Providing easy access, 24-hour assistance that is readily available is key. The ACLU supports SB 347 and the resources and help it will get those who have experienced sexual violence. Thank you. And that concludes my testimony. Thank you very much. Next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 360, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Hawkins, S-A-R-A-H-H-A-W-K-I-N-S. I am the president of Nevada Attorneys for Criminal Justice, and we are here in support of the original bill. We sincerely appreciate the opportunity to speak, and we thank, we thank Senator Scheibel for taking on this very important issue. We support the original text. As criminal defense attorneys, we are often viewed as adversarial to survivors, but that could not be further from the truth. Survivors must receive the support and protection they need. However, support and protection must be accomplished without constitutional transgression. We are concerned that the conceptual amendment currently under consideration imperils the constitutional rights of responding parties. For these reasons, NACJ supports the original version of SB 347. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. If you recently just joined us, we are still in support of SB 347. To testify in support, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 295, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. My name is Abby Pike. That's A-B-B-E-Y-E-I-K-E -E -E for the record. I am currently serving as an intern for Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod, but I am not speaking today on her behalf. I am also the policy director of the Associated Students at the University of Nevada, Reno, and I am here today in support of Senate Bill 340. I support this bill because there are currently no laws in Nevada specifically addressing sexual violence on college campuses, even though this is a consistent problem for UNR and other universities. The task force created by this bill will identify specific problems and provide a comprehensive view of the legislation that needs to be passed while also expanding and providing accesses to resource, access to resources for affected students. Sexual violence has plagued our campus for years. According to the RAIN National Network, 26.4% of undergraduate women and 6.8% of undergraduate men will experience a form of sexual violence on campus. More than 30% of these students who are sexually assaulted will drop out of college. A return to in-person classes this fall should not mean a return to the usual sexual violence statistics. College students are paying attention, and we need you to pass this critical legislation to protect I strongly encourage every member of this committee to vote yes on Senate Bill 347. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 566. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hi, my name is Caitlin Caruso, C-A-I-T-L-Y-N, Caruso, C-A-R-U-S-O. I am a UNLV alum, graduated class 2018. Uh, I'm here to testify in support of SB 347. As a survivor myself, attending college at UNLV, I'm very familiar with the ways in which survivors do not feel supported by institutions here in Nevada. A bill like this, while years too late for me, is just in time for the next generation of survivors who have a new world of barriers and obstacles to overcome given the current pandemic. A bill like this that will help streamline resources, provide confidential advocates, and allow for folk to continue receiving institutional aid like scholarships is critical in ensuring survivors success in both higher education and in their life endeavors uh, past that. I wanna especially speak in support of the GPA waiver as I had an experience at UNLV in which I was exiting a toxic relationship in which I might have accessed that waiver myself. I was fearful of losing my job due to my failure in one of my classes. I was overwhelmed with, you know, the 
um, obstacles that come from moving out of a physically and emotionally abusive relationship and moving on with my life. And had I known that my institution would have supported me, allowed me to maintain my institutional aid, allowed me to remain uh, in my position, considering a lot of work jobs, work study jobs also have GPA requirements. Had I known that my institution would have supported me as a survivor of uh, inter inter intimate partner violence, I would have felt infinitely better about being a UNLV rebel, being an alum, and I want to be proud to be an alum of the NC system today. And by passing SB 347, I feel like I'll be one step closer. Again, I urge you to pass SB 347. I am totally in support of the GPA waiver as well as every other component of this bill. Uh, and have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 805. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Uh, hi, good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. This is Jessica Stender, J-E-S-S-I-C-A-S-T-E-N-D-E-R, Senior Counsel for Workplace Justice and Public Policy at Equal Rights Advocates, uh, calling to say I'm in favor of SB 347 with the suggested amendments and really encourage um, you all to vote in support of this bill. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 823. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chairman Jones. My name is Sage Carson, S-A-G-E-C-A-R-S-O-N. And I'm the manager of Know Your Nine, the leading national survivor and youth-led campaign to end sexual violence in education. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about Know Your Nine's fervent support of SB 347, which we have had the opportunity to work with local Nevada students on for months. Know Your Nine recently uh, released a report outlining the experiences of over 100 student survivors who reported sexual misconduct to their schools in recent years. Through our survey and report, we found that students who reported at their school, nearly 40% of students are pushed out of education following sexual violence. These educational interruptions occurred not because of sexual violence alone, but because of sexual violence exasperated by schools' inadequate or otherwise harmful responses to reports of violence. Survivors describe being blamed for the violence against them, being told the school could do nothing about it, having their cases drawn out for years, and even getting punished for their own assaults after seeking help. What's more, since we wrote and released this report, that number has risen as more students who were surveyed in an interview were forced to transfer or drop out because of their school's failure to properly respond to their report. Throughout our conversations with survivors, we continue to hear the same sentiment shared by survivors over and over, which one put so frankly. Honestly, what the school did to me was way worse than what my rapist did to me. I am here today because I deeply believe and know that SB 347 will help to stop student survivors from being pushed out of education following violence. Additionally, we encourage the committee to adopt the proposed amendments and pass SB 347 favorably through committee with full amendments. A fair process, access to accommodations and a victim advocate, transparency measures and robust amnesty policies are essential to ensuring that survivors are able to stay in school in the wake of violence. As a team of students and survivors, we believe it's essential that any legislation on sexual violence and education should be written by and for student survivors, which is why we are so excited to support and encourage the committee to support SB 347 and the local Nevada students who have worked tirelessly to craft this legislation and support survivors in their state. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Let's go to the next caller. If you recently just joined us, we are currently in support of SB 347. To testify in support, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no more callers in support at this time. Great, let's go to those in opposition. To testify in opposition of SB 347, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 473. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hello, my name is Joe Cohn, uh, spelled J-O-E-C-O-H-N. And I'm the Legislative and Policy Director of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Education. 
Uh, we are a national nonpartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to defending the free speech and due process rights of students and faculty at institutions of higher education. And I personally uh, want to say how delighted I am to be speaking on this bill. Um, I grew up in Nevada. I interned in your Nevada legislature in the 1999 session, and it's such a pleasure to be back. And I served as the legal director, uh, briefly, of your ACLU of Nevada affiliate. Um, we're testifying at FIRE in opposition to the bill uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, I want to first note that the that the first I was originally planning on testifying on the original version of the bill with very modest, you know, uh, criticisms and things that could be worked, and I did not view uh, the gap as being too far uh, to to bridge with the original version of the bill. The definition of sexual harassment, not the broader definition of sexual misconduct, referred to an NRS statute that that, that used a military definition of sexual harassment. Uh, despite case law all the way to the Supreme Court and in multiple uh, circuit courts setting a separate definition for the educational context, and that's absolutely crucial for the bill to be constitutional uh, with respect to free speech rights. But with the amended version of the bill, which I only you know saw when it was referenced by the bill sponsor during the testimony here, uh, it imports a variety of substantive requirements on the campus procedure that, quite frankly, have been struck down in multiple courts. Um, since 2011, there have been over 200 judicial opinions favorable to the rights of accused students uh, with respect to how they were treated in campus adjudication processes. And this bill mirrors many of the policies that are repeatedly, and I say repeatedly, struck down as unconstitutional. And that's not to say that there aren't meritorious uh, parts of this bill, too. Uh, because we agree with at FIRE with a number of the positions providing support measures for complainants, the amnesty provisions, a rape shield provision that includes the constitutional exceptions or would all be positive things for complainants. But Nevada policy needs to make sure it respects both the rights of the accused and the rights of complainants, and this bill doesn't do it. Even the right to a hearing isn't granted by this bill. A school may choose to give a hearing. The right to cross-examination only exists if the federal government still continues to require that you have a right to cross-examination under this bill. And even then, it allows it to happen in a way that uh, multiple courts, including the Sixth Circuit, have noted undermines the reliability of cross-examination. Access to the evidence. Access to the evidence under this bill doesn't include all of the evidence in the institution's possession that isn't privileged. Uh, it only includes the information the school plans to use. So a school that doesn't plan on sharing all of the information it has uh, at its disposal, either you know to protect an accused student because they're a star quarterback or because it's exculpatory and it doesn't fit their narrative, won't have to turn over the evidence. There are a number of just very specific problems with the way the procedures are put in this bill that clearly show that due process advocates have not truly been consulted here. And that's a bigger global problem for a bill that has been in the works for months and months and months and months and months. We'd love to work with the sponsor uh, of the bill and its proponents to find a policy that works for everyone because no policy should work only for accused students and no policy should only work for complainants. It needs to be fair to everyone. And that's m m my basic testimony. I'd be thrilled to answer any questions you have, uh, particularly legal in-depth questions that you have either now or later on in the process. Thank you. And, and if you could submit your testimony, I, I, I gave you a little bit of latitude only because we had a lot of in support and um, I want to make sure we got that on the record. But uh, if you would submit what you have um, and if there's questions, we'll, we'll make sure that we get you together with the sponsor. Um, let's go to the next caller in opposition. We are currently in opposition of SB 347. To testify in opposition, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. Let's go to a neutral testimony. To testify neutral on SB 347, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. 
caller with the last three digits of 269. Please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Dennis and members of the Senate Education Committee. I am Tina Russum, spelled T-I-N-A-R-U-S-S-O-M. I'm a Deputy General Counsel for the Nevada System of Higher Education. I'm here on behalf of the Nevada System of Higher Education, presently testifying in neutral on Senate Bill 347. And she supports the intent of this legislation, but our Title IX campus experts have not had time to fully review the proposed amendment. The Nevada System of Education looks forward to working with Senator Scheibel on this bill as it's NC's priority to ensure the safety and security of our students and staff. There are a number of federal preemptive regulations and NC policies that exist. For example, our universities already have variations of client surveys as it relates to this topic. Title IX campus experts We'll be meeting with Senator Scheibel to discuss how we can collaboratively enhance all that our institutions currently do to provide more uniform to provide more uniformity and continue. I apologize, more uniformity and continuity across the state. We would like to thank Senator Scheibel for her work on this issue, and to this committee for hearing this bill today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's go to the next caller in neutral. Caller, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. This is Kent Irvin, K-E-N-T-E-R-V-I-N for the Nevada Faculty Alliance. Good afternoon, Chair Dennis and committee members. The NFA strongly supports the intent of SB 347 to make our campuses more safe and secure. And we thank Senator Scheibel and especially the students today for their work well, for the students over months for their work on the bill and today for their strong and brave testimony. I am testifying in neutral simply because we have not had time to evaluate the lengthy proposed amendments at this time. Just on a personal note, over the last few years uh, in my classes, I've seen an uptick in the number of students who come with um, issues around uh, domestic violence and other similar issues. Uh, and, you know, needing special accommodations. And I've seen both where the accommodations uh, provided uh, work, you know, with extra time and uh, efforts a uh, student can get through the course, but also where, where the student just, you know, you hear from them, they need to be out for a while, and then they're gone. And that's why we really need this kind of, these kinds of programs to make sure students don't fall through the cracks. Thank you. Thank you. The next caller. Chair, you have no more callers neutral at this time. Okay. All right. So we will, um, let's bring it back to um, Senator Scheibel. Any closing comments? I want to thank the committee for their time and attention today. I know you guys have heard a number of bills and I really do appreciate all of you engaging with me on this one. I think it's incredibly important policy. I want to thank Lily James again for being here with me to present and to thank Ms. Geneva Wolf for sharing her story with us and her testimony. And uh, we remain committed to working with all of the stakeholders to come to a resolution that works for everybody and invite any and all of you to contact me if you have further questions or wanna be involved in any of those conversations. Thank you very much. Got a little bit of work um, with, with all the new changes and things, but I think you'll get that you'll get there. All right, with that, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and close the hearing on Senate Bill 347 and move to our next item on the agenda, which is public comment. So if uh, BPS could queue up the first caller for public comment. Thank you, Chair. To speak in public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, we are currently in public comment. To speak in public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, your public line is open and working and you have no public callers at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, before I adjourn, I just wanna remind the members 
um, that we will be meeting on Monday. We do have one bill that we'll be hearing. We have our regular meeting um, at one o'clock um, and we will also be meeting at seven o'clock to hear a bill. Um, trying to make sure that we get through all our bills and not overlap onto some of the other committees. So uh, make sure you have that in your calendars. Um, Wednesday, um, there's a possibility we might do evening on Wednesday, um, but just keep an eye out for that. Um, with that, um, that's all I have um, to bring forward at this time. Um, so with that, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you.